this is Alfred's studio. The only thing we did when we came in, we put skylights in, because he needed extra light. And he always had his easel there, or just at an angle across the corner there. And that was his easel. And this is the earliest painting he ever did when he came to England. That is the Pool of London. It was the first exhibition, one man exhibition Alfred had in London. And he decided to have a theme. He chose the River Thames because he loved the water. And um, in those days, it was a really busy port. It was filthy dirty. And the water was absolutely putrid, full of oil and mud and sludge and sewage and goodness knows what. And he got permission to get onto the bridge there between the towers on that catwalk, which was closed to the public in those days, and also to ride on the tugboats. So he would ride with the tugboats. And the tugboat men said, if you fell off a tugboat or got knocked off and fell into the water, you had to go to hospital at once. One of the newspapers did an article about him and called him the Spider-Man painter, because he would climb up on the scaffolding. And there were a lot of articles written about him and photographs of him painting in London at that time. But luckily, he never fell off. I think one thing that's very interesting about Cohen is that he was an émigré. And if you think about it, a huge number of the greatest artists of the 20th century were also émigrés. They ended up living in a country which, which was not the country they were born in. The most famous one is Picasso. And many of them could not go home for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so Cohen is not untypical, and he takes his uh, skill and outlook to painting to different countries at different times. And in his case, it's France and England. I would say, uh, when you look at him, you don't especially think that he's an American or French or British painter. He's dealing with an international modern language. And I would say that the way he treated the English landscape uh, is not, as it were specifically to think about England. It's really to think about the language of painting and the poetry of painting and the poetry of what's in front of him. So uh, a fundamentally international outlook, I would say. He was born in Chicago, went to the Art Institute of Chicago, and there he won this fellowship that brought him to Paris for two years, which was an incredible thing to win in those days for two years. And he came to Paris, fell in love with Paris, because all his teachers in Chicago had been based in Europe. They were all Europeans. So he'd always wanted to go to Paris. And when he got to Paris, he just fell in love with Paris and decided he was going to stay there. So he did. He got himself a studio, got himself an art gallery to represent him, who would sell his works for him. And he settled there and stayed there for several years. ben -Uri has a particular connection with Alfred Cohen, as we were the first gallery to give him a London exhibition in 1958. And the success of that led on to his shows at other London galleries and prompted the decision for him to move to London uh, in 1960. I'm particularly drawn to Cohen's London pictures that he produced between 1960 and 63, uh, specifically focusing on the Thames and culminating in an exhibition he did called Aspects of the Thames. Those works draw on his knowledge of European painting, so we see examples of works which come out of an Impressionist tradition, also a fauve tradition, and he also shows an awareness of other contemporaneous art movements, so the rise of abstract expressionism and its equivalent in Paris, Tachisme. All of these feed into the way that he experiments uh, with his paintings of the Thames. Well, he painted all his life from a young man, from a boy, really, that's when he started. And over the years, of course, he evolved and changed. How boring to do the same work over and over again. So each phase of his work changed and developed. I mean, that's the style he was painting in then. That's another very early one, again, the River Thames. We got that back not so long ago, and it was framed like that. And Max says we must keep the frame because it's a period frame from 1960. That's how they framed them in those days. But that is looking the other way up the Thames in the sunset. So it's quite a different feeling. And later on, his work got freer. That is the northern coast of France, the Picardy coast. And that, you can see, is just put on with a palette knife, which is very free and powerful and strong. The paintings, I suppose, are what we know best. They're deeply coloured, they're often very textured and layered. We know he scraped off paint and repainted layer by layer. They're heavily worked over. 
I think with the drawings, what you see is something completely different in tone and in spirit and in technique, in fact. Something much more intuitive and spontaneous and free. You get an incredible sense of, cre of freedom on the page, which you don't get so much with the paintings. He just wanted to conquer every medium. Oil paintings, gouache, drawing, printmaking, etchings, screen prints, lithographs, everything. He just used every medium. What I find very interesting is that if you look at what we call the Ecole de Paris, that is the broad range of artists who came through French modernism, which dominated the world until 45, there are a range of approaches to how you create an image and how you use paint. And it seems to me that Cohen experimented with just about all of those, always with his own individual uh, vision, uh, and always with his own approach to draftsmanship and to colour. But nevertheless, you can see influence from a range of the giants of that period, and you can see him experimenting. For example, uh, uh, the way that he would compose a landscape uh, shifted through the decades quite distinctly. At times, especially in the 60s, it seemed to me he pushed towards a far less representational approach. He never made an abstract painting, but he did move away significantly from what you can see in front of you into creating a symbolic vision of the land. At other times, it's pretty clear that he sat in front of the landscape and captured what was there in his own language. So there are distinct shifts in use of paint and uh, approach to paint. Cohen had a great um, consistency of palette choice across his career. Um, he had a preference for red, white and blue, and we see that used uh, right across the many different experiments right through to the end of his career. However, he uses them very differently. He has an inquiring artistic mind and he plays with different ways of presenting the colours, with the picture surface, um, always seeking to look at uh, the effects of light and the effects of light on water in particular. There's a range of grand masters, 20th century grand masters, that clearly impacted him. We think of the Fauves, we think of Darin, Vlaminck, uh, Georges Rouault, absolutely. Also aspects of Matisse. Uh, so very much uh, a man who painted what he saw and then adapted that into a painterly language which evolved through the decades. So a painter's painter. He just got inspired by different things. That, for example, is a drawing, that eagle. And he did that at the time of the Vietnam War. And the eagle is a symbol of America. And that is showing America as being really, really aggressive. And you can see how vicious that bird is. Look at its head and the talons, the claws. It really is a terrifying piece but it's just a charcoal drawing on paper. But basically all he did was paint all his life. That's, he never had a job, he never had to work. He managed to survive by painting and selling his paintings. That's all he did, he just painted. He never had to teach, luckily. So sometimes he had money when he'd had a big exhibition and it was a success, and then we'd be broke a few months later because he'd spent all the money and we'd have to start again. We would say that as a professional painter, he definitely had powerful moments where he was on the scene and recognised and understood to be a player in London and most certainly elsewhere as well. And clearly, very few artists do that for a whole lifetime, but it does seem to me that he was the quintessential professional painter. He was a most entertaining companion. He always had a lot of stories to tell. He was terrific fun to be with. Everybody thought he was the most wonderful company, which he certainly was. We never, ever had a dull moment. I do think that his art also, if you look closely at it, tells us a lot about the man himself, which is a, an incredible mix, I suppose, as we all are, of the very, very serious, the very intense, particularly in those paintings, which, as we know, he worked and reworked. If he wasn't satisfied, he wouldn't let something pass. But on the other hand, in the drawings, you see something quite light, quite immaterial sometimes, very fresh, quite comic and satirical, and quite silly and naughty as well. And whether that's a sketch of a prize cow or somebody at a cocktail party looking a little bit tipsy, there's an incredible sense of warmth, of humanity, of humour, which sometimes tips into satire and can be quite biting, but it's never bitter. Um, 
I think particularly also in the Commedia dell'arte works, both the paintings and the drawings and sketches, you see every range of human emotion from the intense and thoughtful to the alarming, you know, the shrieking heads that you see. Then you also see the, the purely comic, but also the, the tragic. And I think he could see all those elements of, of human life in the people and the places that he went to and the, the people he met and the places he went to. He had the most tremendous sense of humour and was always very cynical and very witty and acerbic about everything and everybody. And would keep everybody in fits of laughter, especially me, I would be laughing all day long. Even thinking now of some of his things makes me laugh. Had a tremendous sense of humour, which you can see in some of his drawings. If you've ever seen many of his drawings, some of them are really, really biting and witty and clever. I have two, two favourite periods of Alfred Cohen's works. Firstly, the Thames paintings, uh, which I see as a unique contribution to a longer line of immigrant painters painting that subject. Um, but also his Commedia dell'arte pictures, um, which draw on a tradition established by other painters, such as Rouen, hints of soutine, bold uses of colours like red, large in scale very often, and then again sometimes playful. But they're very strong, they're very powerful, very impressive. This is the room he did his etchings in. But there are quite a number of his paintings hanging in here. But that is his etching press. So it's covered up at the moment with various things. But that is his old press. Now these are his paintings. Alfred always had been attracted to the theatre and he loved the Commedia dell'arte, which is the old Italian comedy. In 1963, he had an exhibition at the Brook Street Gallery, all based on the Commedia dell'arte. And that painting was in that exhibition. That is punch, an angry punch. This is a set of drawings, all from characters from that Commedia dell'arte. And this is a painting called The Entrance of Columbine. It's little Columbine, the female character, who's a pretty gorgeous little girlfriend of everybody. And she's coming in on a horse. And there's so much life in that painting. The little horse is just dancing. And she looks so exuberant and full of life and joy. I don't know how you get that in a work of art. It's just there, isn't it? It's amazing. And there's another really, really good one. That is two characters peeping out from behind their grotesque masks. And the faces behind the masks are just as grotesque, if not more so. So that painting really poses endless questions. Does everybody wear a mask? And then behind the mask is there yet another mask. Do you ever, ever get to the real person underneath? How many masks do people have? So it's a really important painting, I think. The whole exhibition was based on the Commedia dell'arte, and it was an incredible success. There were a lot of film people in London at that time. A lot of theatre people came and they all loved this exhibition. It was so theatrical and so full of life and colour and spontaneity. And it was a great, great, great success. In fact, it was a sellout exhibition. In fact, Alfred was still pa painting the same subject and taking paintings in during the exhibition. And they were selling them while they were still wet almost. It was such a success. I think the importance of reevaluating Cohen is not just because he is a wonderful, vivacious, energetic, modernist artist, but I think it's also essential because it helps correct, correctly rewrite that history of modernism, which is not just a history of abstraction or conceptualism or performance art. It is also an incredible history of very daring, brave, modernist, but essentially figurative work. I think the role of the museum and the role of the book is to constantly remind us of um, significant artists and the role that they played in their time and the role that they can play again. So I would say from that point of view, I think that uh, Alfred Cohen's moment is coming again. There's a more intense interest, it seems to me, in painting once more. I think there will be a renaissance of Cohen's work coming back and that it will reachieve where it was when he was at the peak of his career. Benary is delighted to be partnering with the Alfred Cohen Foundation for the Centenary Exhibition. Um, this gives us an opportunity to revisit and revalue an artist who has been perhaps unfairly overlooked as fashions have changed in painting, but this 
exhibition and the accompanying publication really will give visitors a chance to see the work for themselves and to really place him back in the canon of British art where he belongs. I think when he died in 2001, there were obituaries printed in the newspapers and some of the art press, but there wasn't this sort of upswell of new, renewed interest that you might have expected. And I think the time maybe wasn't right, but it really feels now that he is an urgently important artist. Uh, I think the art world is suddenly interested, the public are much more interested in these forgotten masters of the second half of the 20th century who are such a critical part of the story of modern art. Mm -hmm.